Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Think Tech, another edition of Tourism 101. We have a very special guest today that we're going to talk story with, and that's Chris Tatum. He's the president and CEO of the Hawaii Tourism Association. Chris, thank you for agreeing to be here today and being on our show. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to talking to you about tourism. Yeah, well, let's start right from the very beginning. Let's talk about uh, where you grew up uh, and the question we always ask uh, folks. Where you went to school? <laughs> well, actually, uh, my family moved here in 1965, and uh, we never left. So I grew up in Foster Village and went to school at Radford High School. I actually went to intermediate school at, at Aliamanu, and so uh, uh, this is home for me. And uh, we, were, we lived here uh, all the way through high school. <clears throat> I ended up going to Michigan State and then get a hotel degree and worked for, for Marriott for 37 years. But fortunately, Marriott brought me back here about 15 years ago, and so I was able to raise my family here, too. Now, all those that remember uh, government back in the days of Governor Ariyoshi are very familiar with the name, a woman named Betty Tatum. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. So my mother uh, was a, uh, a, she worked for the National Federation of Independent Business. She was a lobbyist for them for 25 years, and so she spent a lot of time in the Capitol and has, it's really helped me in my new job. Um, my former job with Marriott, I talked to the, the legislators periodically, but in this new job, I spent a lot of time at the Capitol uh, championing with you on the uh, things that are important to the industry. And uh, my mom uh, led the way, and uh, uh, she had a great reputation, and so it gave me a, an opportunity to get into a lot of offices that people want to talk about my mom. So thank you for bringing that up. What's your fondest memory of Radford High School, the school that also produced Bette Midler, amongst other, <laughs> Ken Neil Matalolo? Uh, there's a lot of great memories. Radford was great for me. We lived right down the street from it. Um, and I played baseball in, That's in right. high school. You're quite a star in baseball. Oh, you know, I did, we did all right. And it was funny you mentioned that because I was talking to, um, you know, that, uh, you know, Scott Chan from the, yes. from the stadium. We were talking about, uh, so 40 years ago was the last uh, preseason game. Uh, in 1976. That was also the year that Scott threw his touchdown pass, and it was also the year I had my 19-inning game, all in, <laughs> all in, all in Aloha Stadium. A so, special year. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a small town, and there's a lot of great memories. Okay. Well, let's talk about your current role at, okay. uh, at Hawaii Tourism Authority. Now, what made you leave a very successful career with Marriott? I mean, you had a job that took you to different places around the world. Uh, you were doing very well. You're one of the pillars of our, our tourism industry. Uh, I would always look to you uh, uh, for counsel, for advice, because, you know, you were chair of the Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association, you're chair of the Hawaii Visitor Convention Bureau, Oahu Chapter Chair, uh, Oahu Visitors Bureau Chair. I mean, you had a lot of experience there. You're doing well. Why would you want to go into the crazy world of, of government? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, after 37 years, um, I really enjoyed the industry. Uh, Marriott was a great company to work with. Uh, they, they took care of me and my family over that time, which gave me the basis of how I do business on taking care of people, and they'll take care of the business. Um, however, you know, after 37 years, you know, my wife and I were talking about our kids had, had, had grown up, moved out, and do we want another uh, part, next level of our life? Um, so we decided we were gonna, I was going to retire and look at diff different opportunities. And then the HTA CEO job came up, and I thought, this is an opportunity to hopefully not only use the experience that I have uh, from Marriott, but also hopefully have an impact on the state. I think there's a lot of great things we can, we can do. Tourism is a big part of the state's economy, but that's just, that's just a tax revenue. Um, managing tourism is what attracted me. How can we do a better job, not only continuing to promote Hawaii and bring visitors in that, that bring in important revenue to the state, but also how do we engage the community, uh, perpetuate the Hawaiian culture? There's a lot of great things we can do working with the different uh, entities throughout Hawaii, including HLTA, uh, DLNR, um, HVCB. If we work together, I think we can continue to make tourism very, very successful for Hawaii, but also realize that uh, we need to make sure we take into account the community and their quality of life. Now, when most people 
think of HTA, they think about the marketing mission, if you will. But you've introduced a new concept that I think is starting to resonate with folks. You talk about your primary focus, or one of your primary objectives, is to manage tourism. Um, I think that's, that's, that's a very important concept because there's a lot of people talking about, are we reaching the point where we have too many tourists coming here? What are we doing to ensure that local people, local residents will always feel part of this, this industry, not just being directly employed, but everything else that goes with it? Can you elaborate on those thoughts of yours? Sure. I, I really, from, coming from the industry that I was in, it, to me, it's not really that complicated because when you ran hotels, you could market and drive business. But if you didn't maintain the facility and train and support the team and inc improve the experience of the visitor, it would be a very short-term um, success. So bringing that to Hawaii Tourism Authority, we can market, and there, I have... I have enough experience, I believe, to do the right thing on marketing Hawaii, uh, how much resources we put towards that. But if we don't reinvest into our product, and especially nowadays because with social media, everyone ends up in all the, the parks and the trails, the, the places you and I used to go to when we were kids that no one knew about before, right. now they're finding out about it. So we have to reinvest in that, not only physically, but we have to have the, the, the experience and we have to educate the visitors on why those areas are important to us as residents. Um, and we want to share that with them, but we also want them to respect uh, where they're visiting. And, the, and I've found that if you, if you educate the visitor about the importance of the place they're going, they, res they do respect it and they want to do the right thing. So hopefully as we move forward, that's really, that's really that managing piece and balance Will, will be the important part of sustaining long-term tourism uh, success in Hawaii. Now, let's talk a little bit about the importance of the Hawaiian culture, because you mentioned that, mm -hmm. and I know you've been big on that. Mm -hmm. You were uh, a strong supporter of that as, uh, as an executive at Marriott, and you seem to have taken that philosophy over at the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Are, are there any specific things that you guys are going to do uh, that's going to make sure that those who... Uh, regard the Hawaiian culture is very important. Of course, we should all do in the hospitality industry and everything else. Specific initiatives that you're taking in that regard? Well, the first thing we did is, um, so in the organization of Hawaii Tourism Authority, it used to be that you had the CEO, you had a chief administrative officer, and a marketing person. Um, and then everyone reported to them. That's the first thing I changed. Now the, 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 the gentleman, uh, Kalani, who supports our Hawaiian, uh, perpetuating the Hawaiian culture, reports directly to me. He's now on, on so that level. elevated thing. that I position. elevated his role so I can be more engaged and also uh, we, we need to communicate that that role and responsibility is vital to the future of, of tourism. And I say that because um, not only do, does it give us a competitive advantage by having the Hawaiian culture as part of our, our, our thought process and how we market. Um, but it's our obligation um, you know, to do the right thing, not only for the land, but for the culture and, and, and perpetuate the language and, and the music. Everything that, that makes Hawaii Hawaii that we grew up with, we, we need to make sure we're supporting that as a tourism industry because in the long run, that's what's gonna make us successful. You know, I know you must have everyone tugging at your sleeve here and, and, and wondering, you know, what's the process by which if you have an event, uh, an activity that you'd like to see funded uh, through the HTA, uh, what's the criteria that you've set up uh, for those type of activities, whether they come from the mainland, uh, something internationally, or more importantly, someone here locally that has a really good marketing idea, or I should say an event that he or she feels would warrant uh, HTA dollars? So. I mentioned Kalani now reports to me. The other person that now reports directly to me, her name is Caroline Anderson. Her responsibility is engaging in the community, and we also have a component of our responsibility is community enrichment. And to, to answer your question, relative to anything, any, any activities, uh, festivals, uh, um, uh, promotions, from a perpetuating the Hawaiian culture to uh, community in, in engagement that will not only... Uh, be positive for the visitor, but for our community, um, we actually have an RFP process. We do 
work for the state. <laughs> we, we do have a process. You can't just put on the, no. oh, I like that person, or I like that event, I'm going to fund it. Yeah, in fact, we don't really write grants. We mm -hmm. do contracts. Mm -hmm. And so what happens every year, and we're coming on that time of year, because um, uh, we work off a of fiscal year from July to, to June, uh, we'll be starting to put our RFPs to the public. And the RFPs will be broke down with the scope, both from a, a community enrichment standpoint and perpetuating the Hawaiian culture. It will have a scope on what the requirements are, and people can put in their requests on, on, on uh, uh, requesting to be contracted for their events. And then we have a committee, obviously on the Hawaiian culture, we have Kalani and a team of, of we, we, we see them as advisors, to give us feedback on who we should who sh we should focus on and how what makes sense, and then on the community side, the same thing. And it's really important for us is that we engage uh, HLTA, HVCB, and the island chapters on making those decisions. Because one of the things we're going to do differently this year is the money that we put aside for those two uh, uh, opportunities will be split four ways. It's not. The, even though, the, uh, obviously, Oahu has a lot more activity, a lot more revenue coming in, um, we believe it's really important from the tourism industry that the neighbor islands uh, are as engaged as anyone. So we're just going to split it by four, put it out there to each of the islands, and then the chapters and the people in those communities will be making decisions, working with the counties on the, the, uh, the programs they, wanna, they want us to support. Now, you recently had a... Big announcement uh, that made everybody chicken skin and feel that, man, this is the best news I've hear, heard in a long time. And that is the announcement that the Los Angeles Rams are going to be playing a game here uh, in August. Uh, talk about that and how that all came about. It's yeah, very exciting. Um, as, again, you and I growing up here at the Pro Bowl here for so, for so many years. And then uh, actually the Rams appro approached us last year, and they had an interest in, in – um, uh, talking about an, an opportunity to get more exposure and, and actually go after our fan base, which is which is very you know I think is very creative and very smart on their yes. their standpoint. So um, uh, we talked about a number of things, and they said they talked to us about a preseason game, and so we uh, went back and forth with them for a number of months and uh, signed the deal last fall, and then yesterday we announced the actual date of August seventeenth. And they're playing the Dallas Cowboys, so we're it, it was a, it was a great opportunity with the Rams, and uh, they're perfect for us because of that market. Our big market is on the West Coast, but then for them to bring in the Dallas Cowboys um, is just phenomenal. Uh, not only is that market great out of Texas and that part of the country, but the Dallas Cowboy brand uh, and the Rams brand, we couldn't ask for two uh, two better teams to come in from the NFL. Now, because you're so big on community engagement, I know that you've emphasized to the Rams that you'd like to see them uh, doing their stay here, but also try to see what they can do uh, to reach out uh, to those aspiring uh, high school players that may want to be the next Marcus Mariota, the next Tua Tagovailoa. Uh, can you talk about that? Sure. Actually, the Rams are the ones who first brought it up. Mm -hmm. They really feel it's important for their brand and to do the right thing in any market that they go into, to engage the community, especially the kids. You know, how, how do we, how do we sh take the opportunity to have our pro players engage with the, with the kids of, of Hawaii? So they are, um, uh, they are excited about it. And then I got smart, and I actually asked uh, the guy who runs HLTA, um, that has a lot of contacts <laughs> to help me uh, in, in engaging with the high schools and the community. And during, I was blown away our, our, um, during our, uh, our press conference yesterday. We had, I think, 12 uh, high school football coaches at the, at the conference, <laughs> along with June Jones and a lot of ex-football players, which uh, actually I had nothing to do with. Uh, uh, Mufi did that all, and it really made a difference. And to sh show that the NFL and the Rams, the uh, commitment from the community and from the high schools, I think it gives us an opportunity to show them that this is a great place to have an NFL game. Yeah, we actually had four, two former Rams were there, Leo Goas yeah. and Greg Salas. Yeah. You're listening here to a talk story session that we're having uh, with Chris Statham, the head of the Hawaii Tourism Association. We're going to take a pause for the cause, and we'll be right back in more here on Tourism 101.
Hey, Stan, the energy man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan, the energy man, at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Welcome again, everybody. Uh, we have here today, we're talking story with Chris Tatum uh, and his uh, new responsibility as the head of the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Chris, you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the things that you learned from your mom was how to weave her way around the, uh, how she wove her way around the Capitol, had a lot of credibility. I was with Governor Ariyoshi's administration at that time, and of course, we all knew Bet Tatum is speaking for small businesses. You need to listen. So let's talk about some of the challenges uh, and issues that you are facing uh, at the state legislature and how you're dealing with it. Sure. You know, obviously, I'll never be as good as my mom, but uh, I did learn a lot of things from her, and, and her, her comment was always just be truthful, uh, be candid with people, and, uh, and, and relationships are important. So, you know, in this job, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is, so the HTA is uh, funded by a portion of the TAT, which comes from the hotels, the transit accommodation tax. So we, we generate about, uh, TAT generates about $630 million, and we get $79 million of it. But when I say we get it, the, the legislature gets that, and they allocate it to us. So it's the state's money. So knowing that, that's why I need to make sure that we're, we're sharing with the legislators why it's so important that they continue to fund our ability to manage tourism. So as we do that, uh, a, a number of the items that are, uh, that are on the board uh, but the biggest one, to be honest with you, is, is the transient accommodation, illegal transient accommodations. Uh, obviously, legal tra transient accommodations, we will continue to be part of the, part of the way that we can promote those. But if the illegal ones that uh, are not sanctioned by the state or the city and counties, uh, those, are, those are a challenge for us. We've gone from 8 million visitors to 10 million visitors in the last few years with no additional legal accommodations. So you can imagine when you're trying to manage uh, tourism and those numbers are going up and you can't control the inventory, um, it becomes a challenge. And we've asked the, the legislature and the, the counties, and to be honest with you, the neighbor islands have, have addressed it in a number of ways, and the city and county is working through it. They've got a couple of bills that you've been working with us on that hopefully that would uh, be able to, to have enforcement um, that is reasonable. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we, we're not against additional inventory. We just think, I think that we, uh, that decision should be made by the residents and the leaders in the legislature in the city and county, not by the platforms. If they decide to make them legal, then we will support them. Until that happens, uh, we need to manage that because at the end of the day, if it's unlimited, there's a real demand for Hawaii, they'll keep coming and the numbers will keep going up. There are those that say, you know, we can't do without uh, having more uh, accommodation since the hotels uh, are kind of restricted in many ways of expanding uh, or renovating or even building new accommodation. So uh, there has to be uh, a certain amount of transit vacation rentals out there. Well, how do you respond to that? You know, I, I think there's, there's two pieces. One is they talk about the, we talk about the bed and breakfast of the people that want to rent a room in their home and in order to make some additional income. I don't think that's the big issue. We found that more than 80% of the, the, the illegal vacation rentals are wholly owned homes. A lot of them are owned by people who don't actually live in Hawaii. So I, I, there's an opportunity to make a lot of money. Uh, I think what the, the important thing to answer your question is that 
Uh, Hawaii has to decide what we want to be. We have uh, resort areas that we have resorts, we have the facilities and the infrastructure to take care of those, those guests, and we have our, our neighborhoods that we all live in and throughout the day and, and experience and go home at night and enjoy our neighborhoods. And, and the legislature and the counties and the residents have to decide, you know, do you want Kailua to be resort area or do you want it to be a residential area? Whatever they decide to me is what we need to support. Right now, their zone is not having the ability to do short-term rentals. And, that's to, and there's a reason for that historically. So, however, if they change their mind and decide that, that Lani Kai should be a resort, then that's a decision that those residents in the community need to make. But until then, um, the folks that live over there should be able to go home at night, enjoy the, the, the neighborhood, engage with their community, and not have to worry about uh, transient, illegal transient accommodation. So what do you see as the, the perfect balance to strike in a, in a legislative measure that needs to come out, especially at the county level, where the enforcement and the registration and the identification of who is actually operating a TVR, a BNB, or a residential home. What's the ideal legislative piece? I think that the, I think what we have to do is get control of the current situation first before we go back and evaluate if we're able to add additional um, uh, rental inventory. And again, that's a decision made by our leaders. But we already have laws and zoning in place, and to have that enforcement put in place and follow through with that and have control of that first, and then every, every, the, the leaders can decide through the community how much more they want to put in different parts of the, the island. So that, that would be I, the first step, I think, is to have the enforcement and to, to make sure that who is legal and illegal is, is, is clear and that we're able to enforce it in a practical way. Now, you talked about HTA collecting or receiving $630 million of the transit accommodation tax, and that the uh, portion that goes to marketing is about $79 million? No, so actually, the, of the $79 million, uh, about 45 of it goes to marketing. Okay. And then uh, we also put about $8 million towards sports marketing, which is things like the Rams. Mm -hmm. We worked with the Clippers. We're going to do a, a beach volleyball. We had uh, a soccer with Pacific Cup this year, uh, tennis, golf, those type of that, that help us with our branding. Uh, so we support that. And then we do about 20 million of it goes towards uh, perpetuating the Hawaiian culture and uh, investing in our natural resources and enriching the community. The rest, the other piece is we have a responsibility as statute to uh, do the research and the data that comes out every month on what our occupancies are, what the rates are. We, that's part of our, our, our statute. So that is part of, and we have a research team that does that for us. So what about the other part of the, the, the balance of that $630 million? Where, where is it going to? It goes to the general fund. And that's, you know, uh, obviously over the years that's grown. And, and uh, you know, that's what the legislators use to, to support uh, other priorities for them throughout the state. And uh, um, obviously they get, they get pulled a lot of different ways on what they use that money for. But it just goes into the general fund, and they, they, just, they allocate that. Now, as you've noticed when you were in the private sector and now that you've taken this job, through the years there's always been a natural tendency at the state and county level, whenever they're short of money to fund a particular project, they'll look to the tourism industry. Um, so what's the best way to kind of say to those folks that may think that tourism should be the funding source for every project, whether it has a nexus of tourism or not, what's the the Perfect uh, answer. Well, I should say, what is the best answer to say? Be cautious uh, about, you know, once again, just taking it all from tourism because there's other challenges ahead of us and the like. Yeah, obviously they have, a, have to balance. Um, I would tell them from a tourism standpoint, when we, we, we'll always share with them what other markets are doing to make sure that we're competing. And if, as the, uh, um, if, I, if the taxes are impacting the overall cost of the vacations to be impacted, the individual traveler probably does not look at that that close when they're booking. But what's important for us is to realize that we want to make sure that we also are an attractive destination for convention business. And convention business is the ideal business for us to have a base of that business because not only does it help us fill our convention center, which the state owns, 
and we'd like to get as much revenue as we can out of that. But it gives us a good base of business. Convention uh, visitors usually spend more outside the hotels, and they're much more engaged within the resort communities. Um, and they don't, they're not as, as much going everywhere else because they're a little more contained on what their goal is when they come. Uh, so they're an important piece of our puzzle. So as, but, but as you add additional expenses to the overall uh, package that they're offered between us and say Mexico and South America and other destinations, that potentially could get hurt us from a competitive standpoint. Uh, Chris, um, what's the tourism outlook going forward? We've had seven straight years of increases in tourism ar arrivals. Some folks, they think that maybe we're going to start to flatten out. Some say, no, 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 they're going to continue to come here. There's an announcement that Southwest Airlines, now it's going to bring people to Hawaii. What's your take on that? Yeah, I clearly don't have a crystal ball. I couldn't do it when I was with Marriott, and I can't do it. But uh, I, I, my, my initial, when I look at the pace, uh, as I see the information that I'm getting, um, the first quarter of this year is probably down a little bit, but I will tell you the first quarter last year was way up. So it's relative to, you know, if you take back a couple of years, it's still not terrible. It's still in good shape. Uh, going past April, you've, then you've got the A380s coming in from ANA, which will bring uh, more Japanese customers, which are very important. That market is very important to us, so we want to continue to grow that market. Uh, I, I think we're going to, I think we're not going to have double digit growth that we've had in the past. It's just, it, it's just not realistic. But as we, as we look at how we, again, going back to managing tourism, that's really the measurement. I, I see the measurement of success moving forward is resident sentiment and visitor satisfaction. Um, we know we can drive business, but those other pieces are very important as we move forward. Well, our guest today has been Chris Tatum. As you can see, he comes with a plethora of ideas uh, and initiatives that he wants to embark upon. We need to bring you back on this show, Chris, because we didn't even touch upon a wonderful new initiative that he's doing to create uh, more opportunities for our young people to be engaged in the hospitality industry and that scholarship opportunities for people in high school and the community colleges uh, to be able to pursue their dream uh, as a result of a partnership that we're developing between H. TA and HLTA. Chris, thank you very much for being on our show. You're doing a wonderful job. You are a breath of fresh air, and certainly someone who's been a veteran of the industry. I can tell you right now, I'm excited by the prospects of Chris Tatum being there and all the wonderful things he's doing for Hawaii. Thank you, Mofi. Mahalo, Appreciate my friend. It.